Here we are, another live stream. Before we get going, just let me know, is the face all right? Can you hear me? Is everything going, oh, don't let me know about my face, you know, if it's looking weird. But you know, is everything going all right? And can you hear me fine? And welcome to the live stream. This time, I will admit, I've been hoping there'd be a little bit more done than last time. When you take photos and look at it of just the track, it looks very similar, but a lot has happened and I will run through it all. Oh, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, welcome to the Port de Norwich live stream. In this series of videos, I'm recreating a, it, it's from the video we've just played, in 1960, it's the last mainline steam train coming into a Welsh, North Wales slate dock. There we go. 
So let's just welcome everybody who's in chat. I've seen quite a few, I, I struggle to get through all the names by the end because just so many people make comments, but I must say a special thanks to my moderators, Digger, Timber and Norm. Thank you very much for all the hard work that you do. So let's have a look. Great old footage, five by five. So it seems like, okay, so we, no one said they can't hear me, so that's good. Okay, so it's always good when you first get going to just get that little check because you're sat in this room talking to yourself for two hours otherwise. So let's just welcome everybody on board. We've got Simon, David, Jaw 21. Right at the beginning, we had Watery Deep. I think he was there quite early. So let's see if he's come back. David went off to cook his dinner, but I think he's back. Sebastian, who's French living in Spain, loads of people. So welcome everybody to the live stream. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday evening with me. It, it's really brilliant to know I'm not just sat here alone. So first of all, that footage we've just seen is from the BFI. It's a free video. It's the British Film Institute. You can go and look at it online. So please go and look at it online through the link that I have put down below so that they get the hits for, for that excellent video. It's a 1960s local cinema man, the operator and BBC stringer. So it was live news footage from the time. So let's see what everyone's saying in chat. Um, welcome, Stephen. Um, hi, Phil. I didn't even notice Phil. Oh, hi, Phil. I noticed someone saying hi to him before I spotted it. Just so many people. Water Jeep just recently discovered your YouTube channel. So glad I did. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and welcome aboard. F. Cat Frasco Fracasso. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Thanks, Norm. Good evening, everybody. So there's loads of good evenings. And Adam's joined. Welcome Adam and Caroline, nice to have you here. And oh, Simon reminding everyone to give a like and to switch to live chat instead of top chat. That's very true, otherwise you may not get all of the comments and what I might say doesn't make sense. I do try and read them all out because I tend to listen to live streams later rather than with live chat on. And I'm often listening to them a bit like a podcast. And if people don't describe what they're answering to, I get lost. So someone reminded me on the first podcast, uh, live stream and I've tried to do that ever since. So FCAP Fracasso, Fracasso is from the USA. Well, I think we've got a few countries already online. I know Norm is over that side too. Dr. Force 2010, good evening. Tim, hi. Dark Side Scenics, Dioramas and Models. Good evening, welcome aboard. Mike, welcome another one from the US. It's, I guess about, depending where you are actually, it's either lunchtime or sort of maybe afternoon, I guess for you. So Watery Deep, have I ever considered doing a labyrinth diorama? Do you mean like an underground maze? Yes, I have loads of times, but I'm more likely to do an Indiana Jones or perhaps Tomb Raider minecart going through one than an actual labyrinth, I think. I quite like the idea of that. Or maybe even just the amusement part, right? Because that would also be fun. Um, so PRC789, welcome. It's been waiting for it all week. That's good. And I, in case people ask, I, I say it's the second Sunday of the month. Last week was my sister's birthday. So although it was the second Sunday, I did put it back a week because um, obviously, you know, my sister comes first. Sorry, guys. So, um, so hi Mike, hi PRC, it looks like Austin and Mike. Well, a lot of them are in California, so it's a bit earlier for them. They've still got most of their Sunday left, unlike most of us. We've got someone from Michigan, East Lansing, Jonathan, welcome aboard. And John New, hello from South Dorset, managed to find it this time. <laughs> I'm really bad at doing live streams live, so if you miss them, don't worry about it. The only downside is you can't ask chats, and I sometimes think, oh, I wish I could just answer that, because I, that, or could I comment on it? And you can't, because you've missed it, because it's not live. Um, so Simon just asked, what have I suspended my soundproofing panels from? And that's these things. So all of my pictures are off picture rails, and they're just copper pipe hung up there and with picture rail hooks over them, hung with fishing line. Fishing line is brilliant for doing invisible 
hanging of pictures. I put a couple of rolls around so that every single picture on that wall is just hung off a picture rail. None of them are hung with nails or anything. The idea is I'm going to swap them out, but I never do. So, you know, they just sit there. I have to go down a layer. Um, so 10 to 2 says they call it Evelyn Helly nowadays, and that's very true. Um, and he, they live just down the road. Yeah, the trouble is, this is um, based in 1960, and it's the Slate Dock. So I think the village should always have been called Evelyn Helly. But um, because it was the actual slate dock I'm doing, which is a railway part of it, that bit is a port. So I think Port Dinorwick was what they always called that. They were the Dinorwick slate quarry that was shipping there. So definitely Evel and Helly. And I've been there. I went to visit it to take photos. So loads of photos of the... Some of the buildings are there, slightly altered. And the bridge is still there and the steps are still there. So some of the key players are still there. Sadly, no rail left at all. Right, let's see if we've got anything. So hi to train room guy. Um, hi Austin, I've said you. Hi Awalon Studio. He's from Anglesey. He's just across the Menai Straits from Port Dunoy. You are, you're just staring across at it. It's a beautiful part of the world. I do love visiting there. So anyway, um, I just thought I would uh, have a little chat first about my new purchase. It's very sad, isn't it? What did you buy today? I'm trying not to spend too much money, but when it comes to tools, I always feel that's an exemption because that's for work. And I just bought a Mercury X wash and cure station. It's out on the side. I haven't had a chance to assemble it. It arrived today. And I'm looking to improve my resin miniatures washing. So this is everything I print. And quite often I struggle to wash the inside. So they leak resin for ages afterwards. It's kind of a weird dilute resin. And I didn't buy one before because I have a Puyopoli for Nom, which is massive. It's like, it's up here. It is just the biggest thing ever. And I put it on to do one of the buildings for Port de Norwick. It does sound like a jet plane taking off. It is so loud. Um, I've got two doors between me and it, and I can still hear it. But because I got the new Whale 2 by Nova 3D, they sent it me. I'm you know, very pleased for that. I did a couple of videos for them. It has been a beautiful printer. It's kind of a midway size. And the building that I did, <laughs> I forgot to resize it. So I did it at one to 100 instead of one to 76.5 because I normally resize in the slicer. It's like, oops. So anyway, I, I forgot. So I printed it on that. And I just was struggling a bit to get it really clean. And I had people watching me, they were filming and yeah, I was like, I need a better set off. I've got sticky resin everywhere. It just kind of swishes places. It It's not the safest thing. And with health and safety, I thought I would invest in a wash and cure station. So that was my exciting arrival from Amazon of the day. Back to chat though. So who have we got? Oh, John from Ireland. Sorry if I missed you earlier. Um, so I did miss you. Ooh. So Stephen Cameron, bit of a drama the other week. We were taking the shopping out to the car when a seagull nicked a pack of beef off the trolley. I can't believe how brazen they are. My friend does um, uh, something in Butlins, I think it is. In, I saw in Minehead or Skegness. And one of the people there was walking with a croissant because they were running late. And a seagull came from behind and tried to take it out of their hand. They held onto it and it literally shredded their face just pecking to get at this croissant in their hand. So the moral of the story is, let the seagull have it. It's not worth your face. But I was shocked how vicious they are. They really are. I think brazen is a good word for it. Um, so what else have we got? So Norm had one take a sandwich out of his hand, so it's not just the UK ones. Um, average Joe, tools for work are also tax deductible. Uh, yeah, we don't work the same way as the US. So they're only tax deductible if you have a company, which I do, because I previously used to work through a company. So I've just kept it going for this. And it is useful because I get two sets of tax back. I get the VAT back, which is 20%, and then I can offset it against my profits. Sadly, since I went full-time in this, I've only made losses in the company. So um, yeah, it's, it's not offsetting anything, but at some point it's gotta go profitable. It was just beginning to turn around and then my YouTube tanked a bit. So um, it's, it's not got there. 
and a couple of the jobs that I was planning to do when I first went full time got quashed with COVID. So it's been a lean couple of years, but hopefully at some point it will be tax deductible. You can always hope. Um, so Caroline, I read that as a pack of beer. <laughs> She means a pack of beef, but yes, it, it, yeah, I can imagine the seagulls going for the beer. Um, oh, let's not read Admiral Belzediels because that's cruelty to animals. <sighs> yeah, do not put your animals in the wash and cure station, folks. Do not. Um, so, plastic money from X money. That's monkey. Sorry, my um. Mouse pointer was over the top. Plastic monkey from Exmoor, welcome aboard. And um, I didn't, yeah, there was a, quite a lot of people saying, don't fight the seagulls, they've razor sharp beaks. I had no idea they could be so vicious. Um, and they are so big. I was walking past them at my dad's. We went to Harwich for the day. Really exciting. It was back last year, it must have been last August. We saw the Ever Given come in, the one that blocked the Suez Canal, and then we saw Sir David Attenborough go. But I cannot believe how big they are. But you did not come here to talk about seagulls. So um, let's just get on to a question that isn't seagulls. Adrian Gadsen asks, hello Kathy, and what 3D printer do you recommend? I get asked this a lot and I would say, I, how can I put this? I haven't bought a new one in ages, so I haven't researched it. So I'm always reluctant. I will say I had two Anycubics and they both broke. So I would not recommend any cubics based on my experience. Um, they were both the really first editions of them. The um, Elegoo Mars I have makes a huge din, but has printed really well. It's an old one. I am considering putting a mono screen in it because apparently you can do the upgrade. I've got a Piopoli Phenom that I adore, but it is a really expensive printer and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone unless you're doing it and you need that huge size. I printed a whole spaceship for the Traveller diorama in it. It's absolutely my favourite. It is just loud as anything, but I have never once had a fail print on it, I don't think. Maybe it's like, you know, childbirth, you forget the bad times, but it is reliably, nothing fails. It's got a 550 micron lower, lowest so it can't go down to the sort of fine detail some of the others can. But you know, for the stuff I whack on that, I put a whole um, brick building for Port de Norwick on there yesterday that wouldn't fit into the Whale 2, which is about the size of a Saturn, I think, or Mercury. Is it, whichever one, um, it's the size of a, you know, I looked and it's the same as the Mercury X bundle will fit. So um, yeah, it, I love that. And I've got this Whale 2 that I was sent by Nova 3D. I didn't pay for it. It has been a really nice printer. So, um, but I recommend sticking with the main brands. I haven't tried some of them, but stick with the main brands and check out some of the recent reviews of people who do this for a living, who buy a lot or get given a lot and give honest reviews because I have just got them and I stick with them until they break. Right. Um, Simon, back on goals. Commonplace in inner city industrial estates is you can safety nest on factory roofs and burger chains. Okay. Um, Stephen Cameron's asking, anyone care to, or care to hazard a guess how soon the first Top Gun Maverick diorama will appear? Well, the trailer looks awesome. It has got absolutely amazing reviews, so I can't wait to go and see it. It will be out soon. And I'm gonna guess that if you're into fighter jets, you'll be building one already because they're probably just normal jets that you'll normally have in your boxes ready to build um, but it would be a cool diorama the bit where he comes up the middle of the two planes in the trailer that would be a cool one to do um, so F cat for Casso for Casso says he gives it a week after they come out in theatres I actually did my halo my all oh, my three halo dioramas before halo infinite came out based on trailers now they did change the art design completely after the first E3 trailer from the year before because of feedback. So mine's very shiny and Promethean and it's basically now more brutalistic like the first ones. But trailers, people will do them off trailers as well. So wouldn't surprise me if they're already being built. Um. <laughs> 
So um, David Orff is saying he lives about a mile from the south coast and his cat is smaller than the local seagulls and they're the one thing she won't stalk. I don't blame her, they are big birds. Um, Simon says, is it a case of you get what you pay for? Oh no, he's back to 3D printers, not goals. Yes and no. Some brands obviously ask for a lot and you may not need all those features. So you need to work out what it is you need and then pay for that. Because if you're not doing minis, if you want to do kind of big stuff, filament may be better. Um, if you're doing a lot of terrain for playing wargaming, a lot of people use filament. It does my heading because I was doing some test prints and it has no detail to it at all. On um, I was trying to do some hexagons for floors. Just nothing. I was shocked how big you had to make them. Um, and I'm obviously used to working in scale. So it's an interesting one. But when it comes to resin printers, I think there is a certain price point and people who have the really expensive form labs ones rave about them but most people don't have two or three thousand and yeah the price does vary where you are as well so i would say you can pay for features you don't need that's the only thing to watch prc789 asked me have i thought of getting a laser cutter yes i can't afford one Wash and Cure was about the top end of my budget, bearing in mind you had a £20 off voucher, I'll get 20% off with that and I'll put it against my non-existent profits. So it won't cost me as much as it would cost me if I was a hobbyist not doing this for a job. But um, laser cutter, one thing is if I do a lot on laser cutting it helps but it also makes it less accessible for the average hobbyist. A lot of hobbyists now have 3D printers and can do what you do but they can't do laser cutters. So part of me shies away from it from that, but I would love one. I do have a brother scan and cut machine, which I use for thin things instead. And I was going to make the buildings with it, but actually by the time I designed them in a 2D CAD program, I could have printed them in a 3D CAD program. So it was just quicker. And I actually just really love the way 3D printing works. So I just went with that instead. Um, so, Adrian says, thanks for the opinion and info. Norm says, do you guys get the Halo TV show in the UK? It's on Paramount Plus. We don't get that yet. June 22nd, they're gonna send it to us, but I'm a huge Halo fan. and I am not sure about watching it because the people who created it just took the names and did a different story. And I'm not being funny. If you wanna do a different story, choose different names. Do not make the Master Chief something he isn't because you've not watched or played the games or watched any of the other movies. That, and I've read the books, I've watched all the movies, the TV movies, I've watched all the other stuff, I've played all the games. I'm just not sure about something that, it's like taking the famous five and they're all mass murderers. It's just not the way I remember them. So I'm not, not sure. Whether we'll get Paramount Plus, it's another service. It has Star Trek on it, it'll be 6 99 over here. I'm just fed up of people asking me to pay for one or two series that, you know, aren't necessarily that good. I'm quite happy to miss the last series of Discovery. Um, from what the reviews I've seen, I didn't actually miss anything. So, and Halo's had very mixed reviews from fans. You know, some love it, some hate it. So it's not like it's a must see, but I will, if it was available, I'd watch it. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not going to pay seven pound a month just to watch it. Um, so, Mike asked me, any advice for a first time diorama builder? Don't buy too much stuff, just have a go. Make something small, use everyday materials you can get around you. So choose a base that perhaps isn't static grass, or if you're gonna do grass, buy some grass mats or grass tufts. So you can do the grass without having to buy into all the applicator and anything. Use normal white glue. Um, you can use fairy liquid and water instead of isopropyl alcohol and water if you haven't got any around and just have a go. Um, don't worry too much. It probably will be not your best work, but that's the beauty of a diorama. They're small, you can put them on the side, you can look at them for a few years, and then you'll see how much you've grown. Right, let's go down. So Mike, what Norm says, watch diorama makers on YouTube. There are many great content providers. There are some really, um, yeah, oh yeah, I have got, <laughs> this is really funny. Um, Timber says, oh no, sorry. Um, Norm says, better get Mike by Kathy's book that just came out. Oh, I should do an advert for my book. I really should. I, I, I'm awful at self-promotion. 
I wrote a book. Yes, I wrote this book. Look how thick it is. It's for model railroads, but it's all about building realistic scenery. So there we are. Scenery, my old layout that has gone now. Can't believe I wrote a nearly 200 page book. Yeah, it was, um, it was an, it was a year of my life, which I don't regret. I'm really proud of it, but I still just, yeah, it's just, wow. <laughs> um, um, Timbersurf says, did you know you can lease a good laser for about £175 a month? I don't even have the money for that, really, sadly, at the moment. I need to balance my books and get my company back into the black because it's currently in the red, which is fine because it had a lot of money in for my previous job. But I need to balance up and it's just not there yet. So when I have that money, also, I am going to be doing some work if the new job comes off for the tourist attraction and I'm hoping to get a laser cutter through there um, because I'll be doing some modelling for them. In which case, I'm a bit reluctant to get one now if I'm going to need one for that job later. It depends on what I do, but I think I may be needing a laser cutter for that. In which case, um, yeah. So PRC says he has three brother scanning cuts but still keep looking for the laser cutters, mainly for cutting 0.8 mil supply. I'd love to be able to do three mil acetate to do in Cyberpunk City. Really want to do that. Would love to do that. How many times can I say I'd love to do it? But um, I just, yeah, no. I, I could send it off, but I have so many other projects that keep backing up in front of it. So there we go. Sebastian says he has access to laser by being a member of a local makerspace. It's a killer machine and a cheap way of using one if you don't have the funds. I mean, I know a railway club, model railway club that have got one. So loads of people have pulled in together and got them. And it's a really great answer if you can do that. I think my nearest makerspace is Birmingham. It's quite a big one. But, you know, I'm just, I just find ways around it and tend to use 3D printing instead. I, I wish I had one. Let's just go that way. Um, so there we go. <laughs> Dig agreed. Mike Valenti, that book is a great resource. Thank you. So Sebastian pays £30 a month. So that's saying you can get, that's for the maker space. You can get a lot of good deals out there. I'm going to have to put my video on soon of what I've been up to. And Mr. Beam, worth looking at, but still best part of 3K. Yeah. Oh, David Orr said, Kathy's book is a great investment for beginner experience alike. Available on Amazon. Thank you. Doing my advertising for me. Um... <laughs> it was a bit of a shameless plug, wasn't it, Norm? Um, Frank Words asked, have I used a clear resin for printing windows for my 3D printing yet? Yep, I have, and it works really well. Um, I've used it a few times. They're slightly yellowy, perhaps, depending which resin you use. I've got a clear resin in my small Elegy Mars, just in case I want to do clear parts. It's great if you want to LED light stuff as well. I had a beautifully water clear resin. It was the um, clear one from Piopoli. Oh my, did it warp though. Everything warped. I did a set of pipes with it just because it was in the printer and I printed them in clear on the Anycubic, oh, sorry, the Elegoo Mars. So I've got the Anycubic resin in there. So it's Anycubic resin in an Elegoo Mars printer and it was rock solid. I printed this on the Piopoli Phenom with their clear resin and it was like, it was supposed to be flat and it was like that within a week it just warped like mad so yeah it was beautifully clear it was just like water clear but boy did it warp right I'm gonna put my video to go and then I'm gonna come back this is where I go really small and look I did little front bits with film on this time Ooh, exciting going at market now before we go any further I have to sincerely apologize I absolutely forgot I've got two cameras this is one angle and you saw I focused it there the other angle is normally on automatic, so I never focus it, I just leave it to wonder. So I can guarantee normally having one camera vaguely in focus. And I put it to manual for doing my Jurassic Park rain scene and I forgot to put it back. And I kept thinking when I pressed play, oh, it's not made the focusing noise. I wonder why that is. No, oh, it's because it's not focusing. So there's an awful lot of blurry shots in here. I'm really sorry. I am denied about leaving them out, but then thought you would rather see blurry shots than no shots. So anyway, that's my apology done. I decided I would wire slightly differently and I put on suitcase connectors. I normally would get um, standard house 
solid copper wire and thread terminal blocks down, strip the um, insulation off and then just screw into those terminal blocks. And then the terminal blocks, I would screw into the bottom of my layout. It actually worked incredibly well. My whole, every layout I've done has more or less been done that way. But here, I got some suitcase connectors though, ages ago, I had to buy some more. They're not the cheapest thing, but I thought, oh, I'll have a go. So, you know, solder free, which would be great if you're working under a layout. This is actually up in the air because it's on top of a canopied layout. So wiring, easier, but still quite high up. Oh, yeah, I, I couldn't get these to cramp. That was my specialist cramping pliers that didn't work. I guess they're for um, crimping the ends onto this little connector bit you use. So in the end, I just used my normal pliers. They kind of, it, it wasn't as good as it could be. I ended up soldering every one of these spades. But it's basically a spade, which you put into the connector, but you just connect by pressing the suitcase bit round your wires and it kind of punches through. I didn't find it broke any of the wires and only one of them needed an extra bit of pushing down to get it to break. It just seemed to magically make a contact without really passing the insulation too much. So they seem to work well from that point of view. If I was doing this under my layout, I probably would put these spades on and then feed the wire through and solder the track with the spades already on. So I didn't need to solder underneath because you know there's often stuff under them and oh, it's not fun soldering under a layout. I prefer to not solder. That's just, you know, hot things in the air, looking up. Ooh, not a good combination in my view. So there we go. This is loads of pictures of me wiring now. So where do we get to in chat? Um, Digger says it's a really good book. Thank you, Digger. Thank you all those people who are saying it's good. Simon says, why didn't I know about your book? Is it available on Amazon or elsewhere? You can get it from Calm back in the US direct or it's on Amazon. And it was on sale on Amazon the second it came out. Um, I don't know if that makes a difference to what they pay me, but hey, I don't think so. Um, and it's through a publisher Calm back, so you can buy it through them. They will distribute to a lot of US model railroad hobby shops that buy calm back books so it's a calm back book so if you're in the US any hobby shop that carries calm back books will carry it would be my view um, so you should be okay to get it in the UK and Europe I think Amazon's your best bet um, um, where we got to Stephen in the, I'm the last person who should advise anyone but I would say please don't be put off by rivet counters <laughs> Oh, if I was going to be put off by rivet counters, I would have been years ago. I'm the kind of person that counts the number of slates on my slate buildings, partly to know how big they should be, and partly, and I've sized everything off the slate, practically, and partly because it's just how I think. So I can be my own rivet counter. I don't rivet count other people. I only rivet count myself. Um, badges, better diorama hacks. What a badders, sorry. Bad as better diorama hacks. What a great name. Hi, Kathy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Good plug for the book. By the way, 200 pages with 200 photos. Lol, I just... No! I don't know how many photos it's got. I had... I didn't count them up, but every page. I mean, it's rare you've got a page with less than three or six. Nope, no, that way. There we go. You know, every page. I, I just... This is just... You'll recognise them if you follow my YouTube. So many. Hang on, which way do I need to, I need to go that way, don't I? Just so many pictures. And they're not all mine. I ha was lucky enough to be able to access the Comeback archive. So I just went through and got loads of great modellers who have inspired me, who I have loved, and put them in there. Now, at this point, I'm putting the connectors on. So this might be a good time. It's very hard because my hands are in the way. So what you do is you squeeze the suitcase around your bus wire and then the feeders have got the spades in and you put the spade in the back of the suitcase connector and there's a metal insert inside it joins up with and then you just put that little protective sleeve over to hold it all shut I guess. I did need a pair of pliers to just click it shut. I couldn't get it clicked shut um, with bare hands. Um, I, I haven't used pliers this size in years uh, It was quite, and it's weird how much space this takes. Oh yeah Railways take a lot of space compared to dioramas. This is why I don't normally do them. Just a space thing. Yeah. Whew. So that was wiring done. It comes and goes. I didn't major too much, but now we're on to magnets. 
I 3D printed these inserts and look, I am magically in the way. Oh, where have I put myself? I'm in the way. Let's try up there. Um, so there's these holes, which are actual holes that come in the laser cut baseboards. And I just did a 3D print insert that has four screw holes, um, countersunk. It's measured for the magnets. The magnets are 25 mil by seven mil with a countersunk hole and a steel outer. On the other side, I've done steel plates. You can't do magnet to magnet because they're both the same way round, so they would repel. You need to do magnet to steel plate. And that's what I've done. And they actually, it was sold as a set on Amazon. You know, just this complete set, um, you know, magnets and steel plates for particularly joining like this. That's the fuzzy shot, really sorry. It looks like that a lot now, oops. Um, but yeah, you don't get to see the back otherwise. Um, so I, I did it. it, I sanded it a bit flush. It wasn't quite out enough to start with. So I actually made it a mil bigger and then ended up taking half a mil off with sanding. And it's, it, I was shocked. I thought, oh, maybe it won't work. It worked amazingly well. So you put your magnet in. I used M4 nuts and bolts on this, which is what it specified. I found the M4s didn't fit flush enough on the steel washers. So for that size, I used M3 and I had to buy some more M3 nuts that were long enough to go through here because mine were all shorter. Just sanded everything flat. And on the back, when we get there in a sec, um, I've used this to also transfer the electricity as well as hold my fiddle yards on. For those of you who are wondering why on earth we're talking about magnets. So the magnets are double kind of duty. They hold the fiddle yards where all my stock switching happens on the side and they also provide electricity. So there's a red wire to one side and a blue wire to the other. And I've got that O-ring terminal on there, very fuzzy one, but I've got an O-ring terminal and I just screw that, well, I put the bolt through it and put a nut on, tighten it up and Bob's your uncle. Actually, my uncle was called Howell, but you know, Bob's your uncle. It's all done. And this was my excuse to use up every single small screw that I've kept out of every packet for the last goodness knows how many years. Um, because they've got to be really short not to go through the um, sort of ply. This wasn't so bad because it's double ply, but the other side was. And this was one key, so this is just me trying to straighten it up a bit, you know, with a hammer. Very technical. Right, let's look at a few, um, a few whatevers and see if anyone asked about magnets, because I didn't really explain that very well, did I? Um, Water Deep, is developing dioramas for popular one six scale figures of any interest to you? Figures from Hot Toys, etc. Thanks. I love to do that. I'm desperately thinking about whether I do that or whether I do a more terrain scale. Um, I have some one six figures that I want to do dioramas for, so I think probably yes is the short answer. Um, So yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm thinking of doing some landing pads and sort of general sci-fi ones for my, because that's what the figures I've got. And they'd be just not Star Wars universe, but compatible with Star Wars universe, that sort of thing. And if that's the case, then definitely, um, I, I would do them in about 20 scales probably, because I can't decide what scale to do them in. Um, it would definitely be interesting. <laughs> Norm says he'll just take his glasses off for the blurry shots. I'm so sorry, guys. Yeah, professional videographer here. <laughs> um, so, hi, Tim. He says he can, no, he can try to record a one-off special event in SD rather than HD a few weeks ago. So I know how that feels. Do you know, when it comes to the YouTube summary video, and I did a summary video of my dagger bar, most of this will disappear because it's not really a YouTube interest. Okay. So we're now on to black paint. I, I should have used a wood paint, but I didn't have any, so I just used this masonry paint I had on the side. Every single thing has gone black that's not part of the sort of interior. Just a habit of mine. I'm thinking, I'm channeling theatre here. It's what everybody when I started did. Everything goes black. It's like a theatre wings. You don't see it. Everything disappears. I spent a lot of time um, sort of painting black. You didn't get the full front of it on here. It's fine. Um, oh, and Timber's put up a short oil to my book, so thank you for that. You can get it on any of the Amazons, so get it on your local one. 
Um, Jaw 21, where do I source my UV resin from and do you use it for anything other than for model making? Um, I get my UV resin. So the stuff I put in my printer, I get from Amazon. The stuff I use that I zap with a torch, I get from Amazon and I just get a jeweler's one from there. I did use the um, Green Stuff World stuff and it was excellent, but I can't be bothered to pay the shipping at the moment to get it from Europe. Um, so I've just got it from Amazon. Uh, it's, a lot of jewelers use it, just use a good brand, that, well, one that has good reviews that don't appear fake and uh, it's fine. And you need a torch for that. I am considering using it on my filament prints. I've done a helmet and I love spray putty. I just love how spray putty works. But I am wondering about trying on a gun that I have. Uh, it's a smart pistol for a Titanfall cosplay, so I'm not into guns at all, but I need at least the holster showing. And I'm worried a bit about how to spray putty onto it because there's loads of bits. So I'm considering brushing on UV resin and curing it on there. So, right. Norm says calm back books. Yep, that's a good place if you're in the US. It costs a fortune if you're ever anywhere else to ship it. Um, Adrian Ganson says they have heat shrink with solder terminals. All you need to do is add heat. It does it all in one shot. That's a nice idea. That is definitely a nice idea. Um, David Orff says um, Amazon pay the same no matter what discount it goes out to. You. It's not even that. Because, it's another blurry photo. Um, it's not even that because I'm on the combat rate, so I don't know whether combat pay me on the price they. It was paid. Uh, I think combat pay me at the price, it, the list price, the royalty. Let's put it that way. They've chosen to discount it. I think that's their thing. I, I don't know. I'd have to go and read my contract. I'm only an accountant. I didn't read it. Um, I can solder. Um, it does say, Timber says, so if you can't, won't solder, use insulated crimps for spades or rings. You do need a special tool, but they're not expensive. I did have a special tool. It just wouldn't crimp this one. It was too, it just wouldn't crimp it enough. And I wasn't buying a second special crimping tool. Though I do have to say, um, if I was over the um, wire, the insulation, it crimped fine. It was when I was, yeah, but I didn't feel it crimped onto the metal well enough. So... That's ingenious. Magnets, yes. So Edward says, get rid of those scotch locks. They thin the wire and create high resistant points. I've seen endless faults on cars over the years. I, yeah, I don't, I mean, it's only 12 volt and I, I just wanted to try them for something different. I probably won't use them again. Um, I don't do this much of this type of wiring. Normally I literally just solder and put um, uh, terminal blocks on for wiring layouts or I solder and put heat shrink over it. It's the first time I've ever used them and I've had them for about eight or 10 years or however long they've been out. I bought them probably for the original Port de Norwich. And so, yeah, I hear good and bad on them. Some people rave about them, some people don't. It's, it's just one of those things. Um, I probably won't do many. Um, yeah, so I'm, my tiny cabinet is in focus. It's really great focus. Look, I now skimped on the black painting montage for you. So you're about to see this entire thing just go black. I, I do this and get it in sync, but I'm obviously put too much of this first one on. Anyway, it's about to go black. Trust me, it'll be fine. Um, there we go, it's just gone black. Um, so Stephen says, we put together a flat pla plastic garden storage for Mary's friend today. Thought it'd be easy, how long was I? Oh, do you know, I, yeah. Um, nice use of the persuader. <laughs> Presume you mean the hammer. Yeah, I'm good at hammering. Caroline says, I think the first diorama artist to inspire me to want to do it full time and seriously was Hank Cheng. Oh, he's brilliant. Yes, I love his work. He has just got so much attention to detail and just realism. Just absolutely stunning. Yeah, he's a big inspiration. Um, I don't know. Jaw 21. I swapped out the flat headed, but, you know, I'm just using odd screws. I didn't buy any for this. They're just all the ones that came out of packets. So... I think I put a couple of flatheads in just because they were there. Some were hex, but most were just varying different sizes of Phillips. Um, yeah, PRC7 and Jason Jensen does some great stuff. And I love his mix of sci-fi and trains. If you don't watch Jason Jensen, he does some beautiful craftsman kits. It's funny though, he got Red Hook, he just bought it. And I thought, oh, I said to him, 
I went and looked in the um, loft because I was clearing out all my buildings. I'd got the original red hook and then I found a couple of days later, oh, I've got the red hook extension as well and the little small red hook. So I have the original red hook and I still haven't built it. But yeah, he does some great stuff. Definitely worth checking him out. And Thomas Bailey says he likes the idea of putting power through the magnets. I can't say I got that. I got that off a cosplay guy. He used it to attach his armour. And I was like, ka-ching, light came on. I, I don't think I've got a photo in here of it because it was just a snap. I put one on my end of my diorama, uh, on the end of this layout, and I put the fill yard on. And the two magnets will hold it, just two, on its own in midair. And I put the 009 loco on and it ran fine. I wasn't going to leave it unsuspended and take a photo of that on though, just in case. So this is, oh, that's a very trendy bit of camera work there. This is um, me painting white on the inside just to reflect the light back. I should have painted this after I fitted it somehow because it just, it just filled a few of the gaps in and expanded and it was already a tight fit and I struggled to get it on and I ended up just whacking it with a hammer in a couple of places to get it to go down. So not great, and then nailed it down and then filled the gap at the front. But there's always a gap at the front when you're doing the laser cut because they kind of interlock. So yeah, this wasn't a great idea to paint this without it being in place. Um, so Sean, uh, Sean asked anyone, oh, welcome. Um, anyone doing small scale dioramas, one to 144 or less? Boat people generally, um, big boats, airplanes sometimes, anything that's big. The other thing that's 1 to 144 is anyone who's doing an RG or a HG Gundam, sci-fi dioramas, they're all 1 to 144. So I'm, I've got one planned for my little RG Zagok, which was my first Gundam I built and he was just cute. So he's getting one eventually. Um, so John New says, painting a sensible option seals the wood, also aids fireproofing, but less relevant in model railways than theatre props. True. Um, I, I think when I'm doing all the scenery, I will paint before I put the scenery on. I haven't yet because I'll probably paint it a grey rather than a black or a white. But when you, I have had so much wood warp when I put heavy, wet glue layers on it. So I do like to paint. This is aesthetics, this black around the outside so far. I haven't actually painted any of the scenery areas. Um, but it is a really great idea. And paint touch it up regularly through the project because I bash it all the time when I'm moving it around. So Caroline says, I've just bought three world box figures and 13 different Wolverine heads in one sixth. Can't wait to get them from China. That sounds brilliant. That sounds absolutely great. I've got um, a few sixth scale figures by Dogmal Snow. If you haven't seen Dogmal Snow's work, you will have seen it. If you type one sixth figures into Instagram or YouTube or whatever, um, he is the king of one six bespoke figures and his work's beautiful. I wish I could afford a few more. When I go back to earning, I'm probably going to buy one. I'd love to get his current one, which is a perspective. They've got external arms and everything. I think he's got a couple left on his website. Um, but yeah, definitely Dorgmal Snow. D-O-R-G-M-A-L Snow. Great guy. Um, go check him out if you haven't seen him, if you're into one six figures. I've got his... Hanroko Troopers, which were a Kickstarter, I believe. Um, and then I bought them from somewhere else. Uh, I think it was Wolf Gear or Green Wolf Gear or something. And um, yeah, they were, they're great as well. They have likes and stuff in them. So he's my favorite one six scale artist. Hi, Timo Blue Tree Models. Don't worry, better late than never. And I love one six. I actually have a load of one six figures I want to do. But I haven't. It was a sort of thing I started, like many things, it ended up being shelved because I just never nailed what I was going to do in it. I wanted to do a space station, which is why I'm thinking if I start designing 3D space station and landing pads and hangar pads, I might end up offering them in loads of scales so that you could print them for game and you could print them for collectibles as well, I'd probably call it. So yeah, I don't know, still trying to work out how that would work in my head. Um, so Sean, take a look for Sammy Modelbau. This is Ravenson Express. He did some super small dioramas the last time and many a one to one sixtieth. Yeah, um, that's good to know. It, it's, it's a difficult scale to get great detail in. So dioramas are often bigger. So it is generally more warish 
sort of large items type of scale but yeah so so John you asked can you buy download the book as an ebook no combat don't offer it as an ebook and they're a in-house publishing company it's not to say they may not in the future um, as things go by but it would be a big download so you can't at the moment hi Sebastian welcome back loads of welcomes to everybody I think you need to get a four-inch roller, Kathy. I know, but hey, you know, I actually had a bigger brush as well when I did one than the other, but I just got those half-inch chipping chip brushes on my side, one-inch chip brushes on my side. So I'm just laying my fill yard track. I haven't laid it so far because I wanted to check the magnets worked and everything. Um, so this is just more of what I did in the last video, which was a whole live stream on laying track. You can see I've got it down to a fine art here. A lot of painting. <laughs> Video magic is all going quite, quite fast. I um, So Digger says he wears bifocals and just about coats with 1 to 76.2. I would think it's 1 to 76.5. Anyway, um, it is definitely a, um, I struggle with lighting. And I have a lot of good video lighting that I leave on when I'm modelling, just because more light does help. So PRC is working in 1 to 144 to 1 to 160. Right. Sebastian, laser cuts look great always. Current building myself shelves and drawers for my hobby stuff. Um, I use the Hobby Zone modulars. I already had a set and then they sent me some free set from Ham Hattons and then I bought more and I, they're my go-to now. What I'm trying to work out, and you guys will be probably very helpful with this, is trying to work out how to store my paints because I store them upside down at the moment so I can see the colours. It's not working because the, um, they're clogging because the sediment goes into the top on the little Vallejos. So I'm, I'd like a sort of pull out of, uh, I don't know, just, I don't know, still not happy with the whole paint rack solution yet. And those ones on the top are fine, but I've got hundreds of paints. I've got them on black racks at the moment, but I'm going to have to change them around, which means those racks won't work because they're formatted for the big hole to be at the top anyway I need to think about it but I'm not keen on how my paint racks are done but I love the hobby zone modulars they are great um oh John Farrant have you seen any of the abandoned miniatures I love his work I follow him on Instagram first and then I found the videos I really wish I took better photos generally by the time I'm doing the final photos I'm so fed up of modeling the project I just want to get on to the next thing and I'm already mined into the next thing I'd like, I bought a toilet plunger, don't laugh. A toilet plunger is, it's an air plunger. You pump it three or four times and then you press the button and it puts a of air out, which apparently is supposed to clear your drains and toilets. But you can use it to blow dust and water around. And I really want to use that with some of my more standalone models. <sighs> yeah. I need to get the guts to go to my local park on my own, put my Zagok that hasn't been painted yet into the middle of the river with my wellies on, I have to find some wellies first, and, and do it. So yeah, that's, that's kind of a job to come. But let's just say, I wish my photography was half as good as his. Yep, Norm, that was white paint. Reflective for the inside for the likes. That's why it's white. Edward Mills, first thing I was ever told about Scotch locks, best place for them is the bin. Yeah, I'm just trying. I'm just trying. Um, Sean says, I'm experimenting way down at 1 to 450. Very focus off for dedicated reading glasses plus 2.4 magnifiers. I take my glasses off for close up and I've got magnifying glasses if I'm doing it that much. I, I quite like the one over the top sometimes if it's just a small thing, but it's a nightmare for videoing with that. Um, right, so. Digger also has a head-worn magnifier. It does make a difference. So Norm says, the track looks great on the black. It looks like he's floating in a void. This isn't even it. I actually took it outside, off video, because it was outside, and sprayed everything black and then just cleaned the tracks off. So they're even more floating now, which was the effect I was going for. I, I know somebody who did a whole yard and painted it white, so it was suited his. I wanted to paint it black. And I saw a beautiful, inspirational layout once which was black just black table tops almost i mean it was a like this almost and it had a ribbon 
of track going through it and maybe three or four inches of scenery and then that went back and forth maybe if I did it up here you could see it, it went back and forth with the track it just flowed with it you know like the banks of a river but it just it was a railway track and three or four inches of scenery each side it was just stunning I just it was somewhere in New Zealand or Australia I think just really inspirational um so we've got an um Sean says I'm getting a lot of it's getting a lot of landscape into a small footprint definitely definitely a lot of landscape into small footprint in one to 450 I think I've got some like urban stuff uh, they did these little miniatures like this um I've actually got a one to 350 Pacific Rim the thing we're going through your loft to tidy everything out is you find all the boxes and I'm like wow I've got a whole crate of machine and Krieger stuff oh I've got two whole crates of Fosscale models. Oh, I've got this. Oh, I've got that. I just found so much stuff. I'm getting rid of loads, um, mostly the half-built stuff, but I'm keeping all the Craftsman kits. So we've got a few votes for the um, head magnifiers. Um, so that's another few votes. Jaw 21 wants to know, have any living dioramas, i.e. a terrarium? No, I had a bonsai once. I went on holiday and uh, it didn't get watered enough so it died so no but I do like the idea of them there's a guy on Instagram I see who does moss terrariums with sort of water flowing over misted water oh it's stunning yeah they look really beautiful but I don't I, I actually don't have any plants in my house I just forget I d most I don't have any many windowsills which are open to light because of the videoing downstairs and stuff um Okay, so where have I got to? 1 to 160, just done Rufus Castle, Isle of Portland. Oh, that'll be nice. So go check that out. Um, it's by John New. Sorry, I'm reading these out. Hold on, aren't I? Timo. Hi, Cathy. You know me as Timo Delahaye. You sub to my photo stream. Oh, yes, I do know you. Brilliant. Yes, I recognise the name. Yeah, I am definitely sub to your photo stream. Very good. Simon Reeves. Have I considered doing a fan meetup? Um, I used to meet people a lot at conventions, certainly in the US I met a lot of people, and sometimes it was a little uncomfortable. I did get chased down a hotel corridor at midnight by somebody who didn't understand rules, boundaries and stuff. And I, yeah, I, I just, I, I do it for the modelling, I don't do it for fans. So I'll be at shows and stuff perhaps, but I'm not really big on promoting myself. I think it's partly British Reserve and Stuff like that. We'll see. <laughs> um, Simon, I don't like contact lenses. He says contact lenses are best if you're sort of sighted. I don't like them a lot. I used to wear them. I went back to glasses. I find them far more comfortable. Um, so I think it is horses for courses. You know, various different people. I just found my eyes dried out through a day. I was doing a lot of computer work. And if you're staring a lot, it really doesn't work. I sprayed it black because of that nasty white you get when you zap super glue, which I zap these to make sure it was kept. And yeah, just wasn't wasn't looking good. So let's see what else is going whilst I'm busy doing more soldering. So by Watery Deep, thanks so much for joining. And um, yeah, hope to see you again. You've probably gone by now, so see this when you watch it and catch up. Sebastian, he recently did a simple base for a friend who bought a gun down. It took me an hour max counting waiting, gesso and paint drying times, but he was so happy how cool it looked. I find Gundam people just do not do bases. It, it's it's all about the model for them. If they do a base, it's a hanger base they've bought quite often. Some of them do diorama, but it's really rare. And the ones that do them are brilliant. So it's always a shame that more of them don't do them because it's such, I mean, a couple of Gumpla discords and, you know, I listen to Gumpla talk show all the time. They're a great bunch of people absolutely great bunch I listen to you know build sideways podcast you know I, I do you know really get on Gundam a lot and they don't really do dioramas I think it's such a shame because they are so gifted at modeling generally so much attention to detail on just one model yeah but as Sebastian says always satisfying to display so Vincent says he makes paint chips and glues or tapes it to the side of the bottle. That's a good idea. 
I used to put on the white top ones, I used to put a dot of the paint on the lid, um, which is another way of doing it. Um, so Tim says his paints are in a drawer on a shelf over my desk. I've never gotten around to buy, buying any paint max. I bought some, but you can't see them at the back because they're too deep. So they're just going. I 3D printed some, which are fine, but they're black and they're hand paint. So they'll have to go white to go up into the new workshop when that happens. Um, I don't know, I'm just not, not in a happy place about paint max, I guess. Uh, that's actually an end scale. Uh, if you're wondering why it looks odd. That is an end scale test car because I don't have any wheels on my 009 stuff yet. So, and I can't run my Jinty that is the loco for this because I realized it's not chipped and I didn't feel like chipping it that week. So I ran my New Haven um, one. More suitcase connectors, don't hate me. Um, but I ran my New Haven um, loco. It's my favorite HH660. Beautiful loco atlas, runner, sound, beautiful. The Jinty will eventually get DCC and sound, it's just not there yet. It's a Backman Jinty. And I just had to run something to test it. I'd done all this wire, I laid all the track, I did all the wiring, did all the points, and then I tested it for the first time. I and normally I used to run and test almost at the same time. But this I was just like, oh, there's not much to it. And I actually forgotten to do one whole piece of track. <laughs> Yeah, okay, isn't that good? Um, so, Cohen's, so PRC789 says, Cohen scale models have just built a hobby room and put his paints in a drawer on an angled cardboard. I'm wondering that. I'm wondering if spice racks are the answer for some of my bigger ones. Some of my, my lacquers are all pre, not pre, some of my lacquers are pre-diluted so the bottles are about that big. And some of my lacquers are... I make them up and then leave them in a bottle diluted because they're my colours I use a lot. Um, I do that with all the Mr. Surfaces and things. So because of that, um, it's just like, yeah, you know, they're too big to go in the average stuff I've got. Um, so John says, Guru, I got no notification about the stream. Oh, well, you're here now. Well, welcome. And don't worry, you can always replay it and see the waffle that was the beginning. Am I in the way now? Wherever I put myself, I'm in the way. So let's just leave it there, I guess. Um, Sean says, good call on Sammy Muddlebow. Okay. Um, Edward Mills watched Hi Guys workshop video today. He had a microscope with a 10 inch screen for doing close up work. He's yet to review it, but I feel my wallet's gonna take a hit. Oh, wow. That is taking it just so far, an actual microscope. That is impressive. Um, Daniel says he does 1 to 160 and 1 to 48. Wow, that's a difference. I like kits, but I love the design phase of scratch building so much. I have trouble paying someone to do that for me. Um, I love designing stuff, but I also love sometimes just sitting down and clicking. I actually put together my first ever Warhammer minis, which I got free on the front of a magazine. So I got, it's not a magazine, it was like the Welcome to Warhammer that I bought for work. Okay, so that was a work purchase. And um, they were two sets of minis, so I, I made those up. And someone else had built the exact same ones, only the same weekend. It's quite funny, we're comparing it on um, Discord. But yeah, um, they are really, um, you know, they just clipped together. They're very easy, didn't need any glue. So that was quite cool. Um, <sighs> don't ask me where that came from. Anyway, let's go down. So we've got a lot more people using three and a half magnification and stuff like this. So it's not just me. As you get older, you young guns, you'll be like, oh, I don't need it. As you get older, you will. Trust me. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry to hear about the stalker. Uh, he wasn't my only one. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's a bit of autocorrect going on there. Right. Serpa Designs, a good channel, making the living dioramas of water moss, etc. Yeah, there are some great living dioramas out there if people are interested in them. So thanks for that, Awalon. I'll check them out. Timo says, I made all my upright wall-mounted paint racks from 10 millimeter black foam board. Super light, very strong, and just one bottle deep. That's what I want, one bottle deep. Um, but I'd like to be able to put them, you know, quite a few of them so I can pull them out and look and then put them away or something. Just trying to think about how that's going to work. With a, and I'll 3D print it probably and do it in white perhaps. So 
Thomas Bailey says, didn't you think of using some of Guion's model tech track connector boards? No, I have so much PCB that I bought for this and I've hand laid loads of tracks, so I've soldered loads of track in my time. That for me, it's just as easy to go to the side and pick up that one piece there. The alignment is on magnets, so if it's out, you just go a bit and it knocks it back into alignment because then they, well, I like alignment that you could just knock back and forth a little bit, so it's different. So we're just coming on to power now. I'm using DCC, and what you'll see is, I've been in this hobby 20 years, so a lot of my stuff, you'll go, oh, why don't you use so-and-so, it's newer. I'm not using newer because I don't need to use newer, I have older. I bought this, whoa. I start off with a lens one, which was rubbish. Um, it was one of their sort of starter sets, but it had these little, um, small sort of PCB mount terminals for you to put all the connectors in, which wobbled like mad, just weren't very secure. So I was always worried it was going to snap off. Um, so I'm using NCE because when I started, I was obviously doing American. There was a choice of NCE or Digitrax really. Digitrax, the buttons were so small, I could barely see them. So I went with NCE because it's got a nice big handset and I like the thumb wheel a lot. So this is the NC Universal throttle plate. You can get them from loads of different places. I took the throttle plate mount bit off the front and I'm putting it underneath. So all I have to do is plug through the hole that you can't really see in all the blackness. There's a, a hole there that goes through to underneath. It's all mounted underneath. Stunning view of my shoulder there. All you have to do is um, plug it in. I thought the light would come in when it's powered on, but the light only comes on, the LED light, when it's actually up and running um, and then it, I needed to buy some longer bolts so to get through there I think these are N3 as well but they just the ones I had weren't long enough so some longer bolts and just screwed it in onto its nuts bolt whatever inside because it's got some integral to the board and you can put any major connector in with that there's, there's not a huge amount the advantage of this is it's the NC power cap now I have the power pro which is their big set. You can use this with a different connector as the power cab um, kind of extra handset, or you can use it on its own to run anything. So this one handset just runs everything and it just connects into the back here, which is why I picked it. It's a very, very simple system for me and I already have it. Right, let's see what chat are doing whilst I'm trying to get that very short nut bolt into a nut underneath two gauges. Um, so where'd we got to lights? So Norm is suggesting looking at acrylic spice racks. I was thinking spice racks. You've confirmed it. Guess what I'm Googling later. Um, Tim Stringer says his hobby space is normally just a bomb site, to be honest. He prefers to have things scattered around. So having the paints out doesn't worry me. I'm trying to move to a more deliberate tidiness because my house is where I work and it became too much when I put a job. I had some people come at the beginning of the week, totally never seen my house before, and they were here filming, and don't ask me about what, because I can't say, but they were here filming, and they were just, wow, he said, you know. Most people have a studio in their home. It's like you have a sort of home, which is just a studio. Every room in my house currently, apart from my bedroom, has um, probably the bathroom has trains stuff in it I'm emptying out the loft um, the builders are coming in September so I've got a bit more time but the dealer who's coming to take it all is coming on Wednesday and done a deal they're taking huge amounts I had 21 crates I went out with these are in all their original boxes um, and so they're coming for that and then I've got a load more I've piled on which are buildings mostly plastic you know, buildings. I'm keeping the Craftsman kit ones, as I said, but I'm keeping some that fit with the future projects, which are small. And what I'll probably do is a lot more 3D printing. I'm 3D printing all the Port de Noit buildings at the moment. And so far one down, it still needs, I was waiting for the wash and cure to come to give it a proper wash. Um, so yeah, once that's washed, it'll be fine. So I'm just wiring in the bus here to the, um, just that. That is just a throttle plate. That's just all it does. All it does is take the, um, throttle which has all the gubbins in it 
and put the power in there and kind of join the two together. And that's all it really does. There's not a lot of electronics on there. Um, sticking this end is the two track connectors and the power. The other side, you can get two throttles in and it's got an LED light and there isn't really much more than that on that board. So what else is there? We've got acrylic spice racks for later. Um, Ooh, Phil Wright, my smaller Vallejo paints are stored in clear plastic lipstick racks. How have you thought of lipstick racks? And I haven't. I own, well, I don't own many lipstick nowadays. I kind of passed that by. But yeah, I own lipsticks. Ooh, ooh, I knew you guys would know. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Simon, it amazes me that people could be awesome modelers but can't design a shelf. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm just trying to find the best design. Work purchase. I'm sure that's what you told the tax people. Actually, a lot of this stuff will go through my company because it, it will, it, it will be articles. It will be, you know, used in all sorts of stuff. I'll try and sell some of the 3D prints. So actually it, it will all go as a work purchase for me, but this is my job. You have to remember that. Um, it doesn't make me much money, but it is technically a job. So let's talk points. Turnouts if you're American, and if I say uh, switching rather than shunting, I'm really sorry. I American railwayed for much longer than I railroaded for much longer than I've done UK railways, really, in the grand scale of things. Though I obviously caught one to work and school for most of my life, so I've spent a lot of time on them. So this is a point rod, and someone asked why on Instagram why I didn't use a servo. I tried that on the last one and I overcomplicated it. So on this, I've done a really simple 3D printed designed Ujima Flippity sort of holder thing. And I, this is piano wire, which is very nice and stiff. And um, once I cleaned it a bit better than this and I got it soldered together at a right angle, it basically, there's a long piece that comes back and forth, which sticks out front and back, which is really annoying when you're trying to do things because every time I turn it on, it's back, I, I actually bent the piano wire, which is quite stiff, but hey. Um, and there's a vertical piece. The vertical piece does double duty. It goes up through the baseboard and switches the point. Uh, it's just a hole, Pico points just have a hole so you can put this up through it and it'll switch it back and forth. Yeah, this needs a bit clean. That really wasn't gonna solder, was it? Just look at it, that's just awful. I took it all off and redid it. Um, and then, the sort of bottom bit goes down and hits a micro switch and throws the power. Now those micro switches aren't currently glued in, but they're very snugly put into a 3D print and it just holds them. So I wiggled them back and forth until they threw at just the right time that it was part way across on the throw from above. And even with sanding, turning it upside down, doing all sorts of vibrating stuff, it hasn't moved at all. And they're both still working fine. Uh, so it's great. It works really well. It's a very, very simple mechanism, basically. As long as that solder joint doesn't fail, it's fine. I did actually make the 3D print just a bit too narrow. So it wasn't just a case of soldering this up. I, you know, when you do something, you have to prototype it sometimes. I just had to file it open. It's a point to note that 3D prints, interiors of circles often close up on a 3D print program because they make them out a series of straight lines rather than a pure circle. And so they get a little bit smaller. This just, it printed a bit wider than I expected, I think. Or I'd forgotten that I'd got an extra piece next to it, but I thought I'd made that adjustment. Hmm. So we've got debates on electronic magnoscope, microscopes, this is Sebastian. They lag in image rendering. So a real microscope or simply a good microphone glass might be better. That's true. That's true. Normalites NTE. Yeah, it's a great system. I do like it. Hello to Jordan, who's joined us. And GR Railway, welcome. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing there. It's hard to see with my hand in the way, isn't it? I'm test fitting a lot and it just didn't really work. I, I had to sand, um, file the solder flat to get it to work nice and neatly. I This is the underneath so it would run down. And then you can see it goes through a little hole here into my little point mechanism. And this is sped up. So, you know, it, once it fits inside, it didn't. I needed to file that. 
What if it's inside? It's quite nice. It doesn't move off too much. So yeah, I just filed it open a bit. Do you have, have I ever used Fomex to make models? Do you mean, when you say Fomex, you mean the expanded PVC board? I find it a bit soft, so it's easy to scratch. So it's easy to scribe, but it's also easy to dent accidentally. So I've used it in pieces. I tend to use it for backdrops. Do a lot of backdrops with it. Black Fomex. I use it a lot actually as bases and backdrops, but I don't tend to do it as my finished one. Even though I think it's got potential, I've just never got around to experimenting with it. Um, trains in my living room should be my wife. <laughs> no, it's fine, Kevicus first. Um, it, I had trains down my um, first house in my living room. Um, at the moment, it's just display stuff on the floor. Though actually most of it went up in the bedroom today. Um, uh, digger. I've used these suitcase tie fitting for my street lights on the layout. Yeah, you see, someone else has used them. Don't tell me off too much. So Simon says, Kathy, you're not on your own. My house is an electronics computer and model railway emporium. Oh, the thing I find is you buy stuff for a project, especially electronic stuff, and then you don't do the project and you look at it and it's just a square box thing. And you're like, what does this do? Oh, it's a bit of a nightmare. I've got so many bits that I've bought off Amazon and they're relays or diodes. I'm just like, but they're not labeled getting better at labelling. Um, so Clay Mann says, nail varnish racks are some of the most varied if you're after something more unusual in layout sizes. That is a nice idea. I didn't, I put a cap on this just to hold it in, but actually I didn't need it because the point throw on top of the layer actually holds it in place. It can't go too far out of alignment because of that. Now I did this and I put it in and I test fit it and it all worked really well. And there's a hole at the front and a hole at the back. Uh, that light was just so I could see where the hole that I was putting it through underneath was. And it worked really well. It threw. I was really pleased with it. But I just thought there was a bit of sideways flex. So I went away and printed these, which are just extra holes that I threaded on and I could screw down. So it had plenty of support. So it wasn't going to flex too much. Um, not great. I'm not really keen on allowing it too flex because it might just affect the solder joint or something um, and also I'm putting quite a lot of pressure on it when I accidentally put it on its back and bend the piano wire so more small screws from various different things that were just out of the bits box um, so nail varnish racks spice racks so PRC says living in a one bed my my rail my railway layouts in the bedroom like you have a very understanding partner yes you do um, but yeah they're, they're okay they don't necessarily take a huge amount of space mine was down my lounge in my first house here it's been up the loft the whole time but it's just too hot up there it's not a great place for it um, so Edward says Sebastian it's great to see experience of microscope devices it is true it's a great thing about live chat like this is you get to learn so much stuff from people so Stephen says at some point in time I'm going to have to get rid of some of my modeling stuff if anything happens to me, there's going to be a lot of stuff for Mary to sort out. It's not fair on her. Do you know, I won't worry too much. Dealers, um, the one I'm going to, very, very happy to come along and just dismantle layouts for you and put it all down. You're never going to get a great price compared to selling it on eBay. But, you know, there are always people who are willing to come and, and sort things. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, but if you've got too much stuff, it can weigh you down. So just I'm feeling quite good about freeing up the space of mine. I've still got too much stuff. I still need to have another go round um, on getting rid of some of the stuff. Um, so what else have we got on here? So PRC789 said, I was once told that points are only used as a name in British model railways. The railways use switches. Don't know how true it is. I don't know. Um, I find the word switch quite confusing for people, but Americans call them turnouts and switching so I'm guessing but people often get confused when you say switching um, I find but then points has loads of other meanings Sebastian you need to learn how to braise and it's cheap okay I probably do that's the only thing I think really apart when the well the bridge won't even be that kind of fixture oh more blurry camera work oh what a class expert here Ooh, 
tell she does this for a living. You can just see the micro switch there, which would have been a beautiful photo of it. Um, and this is what I'm wiring in. I don't think I'll put too much of this footage in because it is really blurry. But basically the micro switch is just shoved into there. The vertical bit of, um, well, piano wire just goes back and forth and throws the switch. It's really, really simple. Tim says he was messing about with micro switches on my point rods the other day. One problem I had, which caused me to take them off again for now, was they caused a brief short on every throw. I'm not getting that, but I've put mine so that they throw in the middle of the switch as it goes over. There's a distance of travel. So as they go in, there's a normally open and normally close. It has left one side before it clicks onto the other. I've not had a short on them yet. And the NCE system's fairly, unless you've run onto it, it's not gonna short anyway. So unless you're actually on it whilst you're throwing them, in which case you've already shorted it, um, I'm not seeing any issues at all with it. Um, so there we go, first test run. Yeah, I hadn't got the micro switch sorted or, and also my point throw was a bit high, so it was catching on the loco. This is a um, Shapeways print. It's a Rushton Hornsby little switch. You can still go and buy it, 009, if you look it up, it's there. And it's a Tommy Tech HM01 base. I've put in a little, I can't remember which, I could find it out, decoder and a stay alive capacitor. I think it was Digitrains. Digitrains were really, really helpful about four years ago um, when I got this and I said I'd do them a shout out. So I better check it is Digitrains as I've just given them a shout out. Um, but yeah, it was a, a beautiful, always on something this small, stay alive capacitor for if you're going over anything because there's just nothing in those wheel bases this is just not enough to keep them going. So I do recommend, and you can easily fit a stay alive capacitor into something that size. <laughs> so um, I can just see this bright yellow thing from Norm, who's given me, a, thank you very much, Norm, a um, donation to get myself an assorted mix of mini screws. I think I do need them. <laughs> yeah, I was really picking through going for ones that were less than six mil to get through this. So we are now onto the backdrop coving. I like the idea of theatre wings. So I have added some extra 3D prints onto the sides at the front. I also put eventually a bit of balsa wood, which was totally wrong, but it was all I had, um, to extend the top down for the same principle. The lights were showing too much because it was exactly flush. And theatres have wings and they have pelmets at the top and fascias and all sorts of things. And this was just so that um, the, you didn't look straight down to it going off. There's a little bit of a reveal on the sides. I also coved the top and this was just curved to exactly the same as the wood, but somehow magically doesn't line up. It's the same diameter I measured it with my, um, well, actually if I found a bottle that was exactly the right size and measured that. Um, and then I coved the corners. Why coving? Well, it makes the light look good on the vertical corners. You get a really sharp line. I would never put a square corner anywhere if I could avoid it for a backdrop because you just get that line that goes, you know, the light this direction and the light that direction in a different. Here's a line. Boy, does it say this is a diorama. I coved the top just because I felt like it. And actually, it also helped with the lighting which comes in a minute but that was a happy accident I trust you I hadn't thought of that when I coved the top at all um, right let's see what else um, so Norm says nice job on the manufacturing thanks Norm so we've got another vote for magnify and microscope but not at the same time that's Vincent Sanders uh, Tim Williams said the point blade did tend to, so the point blade he has having problems with shorts when throwing the point blends tended to connect before the micro switch clicked. Only really a problem if you're throwing points when something's moving. My micro switch is just shoved back and forth until it clicks in the right place. There's nothing very technical to it. So I just moved it further in until it wasn't causing any issues. Um, GR Railway, you really want me to model in 009 really inspired. It is a gorgeous scale, but it is like modeling N scale, but with 00 scale scenery. 
and double O scale is what I'm used to, well, HO, um, but it's very similar. So it has been really, really good, but your track work has to be bulletproof, which is why I'm doing version two of Portrait Nordic, because version one's track work just wasn't good enough. Just because it's like N scale, you know, it just has to run. I mean, 009 is beautiful. It's really, really good. Um, so Timo asked, are those manual point words, are the SDLs available for sale, please? I was going to do a whole Port de Norwick file of bits and bobs. Um, so I can shove it up, yeah, um, on the website. I was just going to do it as a whole piece. I don't think anyone will be that excited by the point mods, but I can definitely put them up there. Um, I don't think I'll charge for those point rod things. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put them up on my website over the next week. It, they go up on Gumroad, but they're free. Uh, well, actually, you can pay as much as you like for them, but they're free. Um, and then I put them on my website as well. So, um, Timo, I will try and do that tomorrow. So perhaps check my website later in the week and they should be there. Okay. Simon says, getting rid of stuff can be very cathartic. Sometimes it's hard to part with things, but they're probably the things that one needs to get rid of. What I found was I had all these hopes and desires for a lot of it, and you're getting rid of the hopes and desires that went with the purchases. And that is what's quite hard. It's that, oh, I'm never going to build this. Other things, I was like, I half built this. I've been there, I've done it. I'm happy to get rid of it. But it was just, and actually I didn't get rid of some of the ones that I could possibly use in future for the very reason that they're all expensive purchases and you don't get the money back when you sell them second hand on seeing your bits and bobs. Um, <laughs> Stephen's just become aware of mortality of late, so he's apologising for sounding morbid. I really notice as you get older how much it becomes more prevalent in your thought process, whether it's ageing parents or yourself ageing. And I certainly have a lot more aches and pains than I used to, so don't worry, I think it comes to everybody. Um, and as PRC 789 says it's a scary thing I think everyone thinks about it eventually it is scary and Richard Pike has finally made it to a live streaming and we're talking about morbid things like that oh Timo says has also given me a donation no problem thank you ever so much for that um, I better put them up tomorrow I'm doing a Monday where I'm trying not to model and just do things that go up on the website and do some of the admin stuff I've still got my accounts to do now uh, just an aside, another blurry picture. <laughs> really should have got that camera in focus. Um, but as you say, it's a great backdrop of the um, China cabinet. I used epoxy automotive filler, helps the really big mask on here, to quickly fill it. Um, a, I'd put the 3D print on the side. B, the interlocking MDF, uh, sorry, plywood thing, just doing my head in. So I skimmed it all. Then I went and put the balsa on and then I had to fill it and do it again. That was just an extra bit at the top. And then I thought, oh, there's a couple of dips. I'll just, put, I can't be able to do the epoxy filler. It stinks. This was a day later. I know what I'll do. I'll just put a bit of super glue on. And those super glue are just file at a different amount and they don't, so bad idea. Every time I do super glue as a filler, I regret it, but hey. It's my little mouse doing good work, filing everything back down. I just wanted a thin skim, but there was definite bumps that were very visible. It's still a little bit visible, but I'll probably go and just do the one or two bumps now by hand. So now we're on to lighting. Lighting is an amazing thing. I went with a canopy unit so I could control the lighting on this. I could have just done it on my own um, very impressive video lighting setup that can go cool if I want, but I wanted it to be integral and to be a complete model railway. And I just bought, I already had some lights for this, but they didn't have the dimmer. And I got this, not this brand, but this dimmer type for my airbrush brief, just as a matter of interest. And I really like the idea of having a dimmer. And it's so useful when you're doing light effects. Like if I, I put rain on a background to show somebody how rain worked on the back of this. And it doesn't work as well on this as it does on my um, Jurassic Park one as an aside, because that's got a black background and this has got a white and it does make a difference. But because I um, I wanted the dimmer, I just bought a new set and they're not expensive. It's five meters of LED tape. I don't trust the glue. So thankfully the tape is big enough to go through the pre-drilled holes that come over the laser cut baseboard. So I just took it all off, threaded it all through and then glued, used its tape to um, stick it down and then went over it with hot glue 
because I really do not trust the sticky tape on these things. It comes off it's so often. But I spent ages trying to get that connector through and then discovered it just didn't fit, but it went the other way. So that was good. So where was I? I've welcomed Richard. Um, Tim says, uh, at the Heritage Railway where he volunteers, they say points, not switches. That includes the printed rule book. Well, that's interesting. So mainline might be different, you know, as Tim says, everywhere has its own rules. So Sebastian says, so many cables and connectors, isn't an OCB breadboard more simple? Some have continuous lines, so you just need to wire plus and minus in each line. They said, don't know much about trains. Yeah, you just end up with a lot of wire runs to a breadboard. And one of the accepted truths is that you should minimise your wire runs. So you tend to put a main bus wire, and bear in mind, this is quite a small railway. You'd normally run a main bus wire around that's a bigger gauge. I haven't run it as a bigger gauge here, but you'd run quite, um, I used to use solid copper core house wiring, 13 amp house wiring for mine. So you do quite a big gauge round and then the feeder wires can be a bit thinner and you put those through. It's just the, when you've got a huge amount to do, coming back to a breadboard would be a lot of extra wire compared to running a small feeder down to a bus. It's just the reason for doing it. Richard says, I chatted to Cathy on Insta, but I'm usually busy on one-to-one -one railways and end up missing these. Oh, we all have busy lives. I wouldn't worry about it. So Tim's back on his point micro switches. Whatever he did, the sweet spot for the micro switch was impossible to find. D ah, so he's retrofitting a 3D print to existing rodding that may have too much play in it. More to the point, have you wired your points for DCC or not? So bear in mind, I modded my points in the last episode. So I have, um, I have cut the frog connector onto the moving point blades and I have, so I cut through the rail and I wired a permanent connection so that the point blade is always the same as the one next to it. So uh, the rail that it throws to. So it's never ever gonna be a different. So all I'm throwing is my frog. I'm not throwing the moving point blade. So I'm guessing that's why I'm not having any problems. And if you're doing DCC, um, that's what they always told you to do on the big code 83 turnouts I did. So I just did it on this. I asked around. People, some people did, some people didn't, so I did, because it was what I was used to. And I had to buy a special little saw to do that four cuts in track. But it was worth it, because it works with no shorts. So, switches US, turnouts for the UK. Greery points. Okay. It's definitely switches are US, Points are UK, but turnouts are American. And nobody says turnouts in the UK, I don't think. So, Sean says, 009 is what got me back into modelling for all I'm doing at the scales now. Yeah, well, we all like to be a bit scale agnostic and do loads of other stuff. So, I think I'm about to do a test here after I've mm, hot glued. I actually did it before I hot glued, but I switched the order in the video so it made more sense. Um, this is a cute little Dremel hot glue gun, and it, it, it is good, but it doesn't, it runs out of oomph after about four squeezes, so you have to wait for it to catch up again with its heat. <laughs> Tim says one to one railways can take over your life. Oh, yeah. So, by Tim Stringer. Um, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. And then... So Richard is part owner on a loco. See, people don't just play with small ones. They like to play with big ones too. <laughs> Stephen says, ladies don't age, Cathy. They blossom. Oh, I'm definitely blossoming then. Um, yeah, Adrian hit the nail on the head. You've got to limit your spending, especially impulse buying. I'm trying to be more deliberate about what I buy. But what I find is, because it's my job, I buy future projects and then I got distracted from those projects. So I have the project, but I haven't done the work on it. Especially 3D print SDLs and things like that. I have quite a lot of those. So I purchased this acetate. It's 3 mil acetate for Jurassic Park. And I cut it down for that and then never used it because I realised 
to do my rain projection I needed a black and clear sides weren't going to cut it like I originally thought. So I have these three pieces, actually had four bits of clear acetate that I decided to use as the top of the lighting to hold in the LEDs when they inevitably fall off, hold in some diffusion material. I've also sprayed them with matte spray paint, um, not spray paint, matte spray varnish. It's just a um, plastic coat hobby craft sealer. So it's a matte varnish took them outside, sprayed them on one side. I've put that on the outside so that you don't get any reflections up looking at them, they're nice and matte. So I've got my LEDs, I've got diffuse plate packing material, which is the stuff you put between your plates. And there's a gap between that and the LEDs because it falls onto these acetates. So there's about whatever the gap of that piece of wood is, um, 50 mil probably, five centimeters, probably about that um, gap. And then there's this diffuse material and then there's these bits of acetate. Took me a while to work out how to mount them. What I did was I, um, I put them in at the back. It's fine. I've got that coving, which I know is just glued on with epoxy. And I didn't say I glue everything with epoxy and super glue. You might have noticed that I do the epoxy because it's stronger, but the super glue sets off immediately with a bit of zapper, so you don't need to hold it for long. So I did epoxy everything and then super, so I super glued everything and epoxied it at the same time. So it's got two different types of glue on there. So I just put the acetate in, I did it a couple of times. Um, once it was on the front, it was just showing. So I put in that extra bolster strip I talked about, which is so wrong because you can't hold it by the front now. But I put in that extra bit of um, black at the front and I then 3D printed myself, I just used screws on this attempt, which you'll see here, but I 3D printed myself a little clip and I screwed that down onto the top of the wood once I'd got the extra um, piece of sort of fascia in to hide those clips. And I think it looked all right by the end. Uh, what isn't easy, one or two of them have ridden up there a little tight and you can't knock them down the gravity isn't pulling them down. So I probably need to over some point go and just um, sand them a little bit easier so they come down because they are really quite tight, but it works and you, you get the effect I wanted. So there we go. Super glue gets abused. It was actually invented for gluing wounds back together in Vietnam War. Hence why it's not great when you get it on your skin. Oh yeah. Tell me, tell me about that one. Um, Edward says, speaking from experience, morbid thoughts also come when you have your morbidity tested by various medical knockbacks to all your parents my mum's been ill a lot over the last couple of years and it's it's been quite hard yeah norm says the sticky tape is not reliable good job gluing it i mean i put it up just as test fits and hasn't even stayed up that long so yeah you do need to super glue tell you the other um sorry hot glue the other hot glue i've got is a little bosch pen which is great for just small jobs heats up really quickly it's just portable it's wireless so i do use that quite a bit as well so David Orff says, three years ago last October, I ended up in hospital. Told if I hadn't got me when I did, I'd not made it to that Christmas. Fine now, but it's amazing how that changes your perspective. Yeah, I think the other thing I would say is people who put off things to retirement, don't, don't put them off to retirement. You know, do them when you can, because you just never know what life's got in future. But I'm glad to hear you're better, David. Oh, and Norm's glad to hear it too. Tim says, nice division of the total length. I actually ended up with one more bit on the right than the left, but thankfully you didn't notice that, Timber. <laughs> so Sebastian says, super glue is a World War German invention. That's interesting. Um, Norm, that's a lot of lights. Do you plan on shooting for TV? Actually, I dim them. Oh, that is a lot of light. But I just, it's for evenness. You want to put quite a lot in to get evenness or you get shadowy patches which probably wouldn't matter that much. Um, but then you can dim them down. So I do dim them down. So 3D printing is going to be the next video, but I've just put a little bit at the end here about the bridge that I did. I actually designed this bridge. Look at this really arty video work that you can't actually see anything. And I did this bridge, it's printed on the whale too. I designed it in Fusion three, four years ago and I printed it out. And you can see it's got a little cog on it there. I'm just cleaning up the 3D print here. Uh, I just snipped most of the supports off before I cured, and this is just a final little snip. So my gloves are on because it's not cured, um, and you shouldn't touch uncured resin. It's got a very small gear. I'm debating whether to just reprint the whole thing 
with a bigger gear on. And this will go in the um, Fatima, this will go in a Port de Noit package. I'll do a package of all the buildings at the end. Um, so if anybody wants them, um, they'll be there. Um, uh, there's quite a lot of buildings. Um, well, I say it's quite a lot of buildings. There's at least five and a, brick and a gate. So they'll go together, maybe some steps. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm still undecided. It's very jerky when it comes up because it's such a small gear. And I've got two ways of doing it. One, I actually put the gear somehow onto the bridge in the same circle as that one there, which is the, you know, the big circle at the back, because that is actually what the bridge did. It used that circle somehow. Um, and there's sort of a bit of a rack and pinion type effect on the top. But I, I designed a filament base. It's just in filament for now. It'll probably get It'll probably be filament permanently, but I might use a bit of resin to do the stone edging on it. Um, just cleaning up the end of my print. Probably should have wet sanded this, but it's only a little quick clean. It's been cured at this point, I think, because my gloves are off. The gloves are off, so it has been cured, which is why I, I probably should have been wet sanding it. And piano wire, just as a hinge. This was version one. I actually made a little divot. Oh, I broke that drill bit in there. Um, I actually made a little divot on um, when I fed them in, so it was easier to get it in on the second version. Yep, and I don't know, it's just that, that gear is just not working well. It's too abrupt. Let's go back to comments where you see that yourself. Um, so, point sellers, wow. So Sebastian's um, saying, a few decades before Vietnam, they're all just the same, sad. So that's all about super glue. Richard is saying they have points in the Middleton Railway rule book, which is interesting. Um, we've got a bit more on super glue. What about heat from the LEDs? Edward, it's a good question. There is a gap. Um, I, I did wonder about drilling some holes in the top just to allow the heat out. There are some holes at the back. Overall, um, yeah, it will get heat, but if you're going to put diffusion and packing around, it's not actually sitting on the LEDs itself. Just quickly back to the base, sorry. Um, I didn't quite get it right this first time. It, it was jamming on the bridge, so I spent a lot of time cutting and filing it away and then just ended up reprinting it because it was quicker than trying to get it all worked. And I needed to reprint it anyway at this point because there were some issues with some of the internal fitment not allowing it to go up as well. By the time I'd done all that, I just put a reprint on. This is why I love 3D printing. I just reprinted another one. And the second one magically just works. But I've now cut too much slack for the bridge and the bridge is just a little droopy. So it's not the final version. There will be a version three. Richard, you do get heat from those LEDs. It's just, um, I've got LEDs in an explosion with cotton wool around them and you do get heat. It's just not as much as you would from, but there is definitely heat. Um, yeah, I think people use all sorts of things for diffusing paper, like, um, yeah, all sorts of things for diffusing. This, the matte spray is a good one. That plate material I had for wrapping all my stock in, so I've got tons of it, which is why I use it on all these projects. It's just so much easier um, because I've already got it. Okay, so David has now upped the super glue back to discovered by Eastman Kodak while working on see-through gun sites in the USA in 1942. So we've gone from Vietnam to Germany back to the USA. Um, Stephen asked, will I be putting ambient sound on this layout? It's a really good question, Stephen. And I think the answer is yes, because the small loco hasn't got sound in it, but the big one will. And I will think about how I do that sound. I think it will just echo around a bit and probably. I have the speaker and I have some sound files for that Rushton Hornsby. Am I saying Hornsby? Anyway, for that little diesel. And yeah, I just need to um, work it out. But yeah, definitely some ambient signs. I have loads for docks and things, but they're all like big ports. Oh, now this is it being vicious. You see, it's just a little, you can't, it's just a little rack that you pull back and forth and it works on that gear a bigger gear would be better i think i'm just going to put a bigger gear in the base um that when you pull it it doesn't move that one as much 
and just put it next to it on that. So it can be downloaded. The problem was that the gear was coming through the top. So here's just a couple more test runs. <laughs> yeah, Richard says, did they stick their eyes to the gun sight? <laughs> and so David, no one at the time thought it was useful, so it did not come out commercially until 1958. I think it's fascinating, the history of some of these things. So there's my interloper, because I don't have a working double O loco, actually, in that's chipped. And NCE, one of its flaws is it won't run an unchipped loco. They say it's deliberate so that nobody can sue them, I think. for. So you just put it on, it goes, it makes that buzzing noise. Doesn't do anything. Um, so Matt Smith has arrived. Oh, well, do catch the end and then you can definitely rewatch tomorrow. Um, so, but welcome and thank you for making it for a little bit. Simon, good call for clarification. I remember using, he remembers his dad using Kodak films when he was a kid. He developed his own photos. He has an Eastman spork as an aside. I thought a spork was like a cross between a spoon and a fork. So maybe I'm missing something there. But um, I remember Kodak film. I'm old enough to have used that. Didn't, didn't really develop a lot myself. There we go, little run of that one. It's running really well, actually. I'm really pleased with that. Looks a little high, but we'll work on that. Um, <laughs> well, Norm likes the bridge. Says I could use a worm gear to mesh with the small gear on the bridge, which would slow it down and smoothen the action. I'll have to think about that, Phil. I, I, what I was thinking was a quadrant large gear. Oh, there's the, the building I've 3D printed. It's the wrong size. It's one to a hundredth, so it, it's why it looks so small. Um, but it's gone bigger, but it's then too big width way, so I've smushed it front to back a bit. So I'm going to see what that looks like. And that's a mock-in, again, smushed front to back to fit in there. I don't think it will really show, just to see how tall the actual, it's a quite a t tall wall there. And then, you know, there's the little one running back and forth. But you're right, it is quite bright, isn't it? Um, I can turn it down a bit. I probably just got turned it up too much for these. Or I could actually change the camera settings, which would be novel. Um, but it's a nice little runner. It's a little clunk over those points. But, you know, runs well. Wow, those bridges had huge counterweights. Yeah, and I think that's what they used to transfer it. I think that's the end of everything. So back to me, full screen. Oh, scary. Um, so yeah, I was thinking of doing a quadrant, a really big one on a quadrant, and then the small one at the top to, you know, that way around to mesh, because there's a limited amount before it starts coming out the front. That's my issue. Um, Probably best to put the teeth on the inside face of the curved section of the bridge. Yeah, I'm being lazy. I don't really want to reprint the bridge because, you know, it's a big print. I'm just being lazy with it, really. If I can find a way just to print a filament um, weight, uh, sorry, a filament big cog gear, whatever you want to call it, then I'll do that instead. Um, and then put that through with another bit of piano wire further down. And look, sexy chat XYZ, adult dating site made an appearance, but Norm got in there and deleted them. Thank you so much, Norm, for whatever they were saying. I'm guessing it wasn't what we were after. Um, so, very smooth. It's not that smooth, sadly. Oh, the running. Yeah, the bridge isn't smooth, but the running is smooth. I'm, I'm really pleased with that. Definitely put stay alive capacitors in. That's my top tip. Oh, and the spork is the spoon and the fork. Oh, good to know. Um, so GR Railway asked, so would the locos and slate come from now Clamberis Lake Railway? Yes, I think it was called the Padan Lake Railway, or the Padan Railway at the time. And it ran down the side, ran across the fields effectively to here, and then it went down a giant incline um, into a tunnel at the bottom and out into this dock area. What was fascinating was they didn't decant the slate, they just had these massive flat cars effectively with... Um, they were transporter wagons and they just loaded the little 009, we'll call them for now, um, wagons onto this big transporter lot. And there was like a little guards van on the back as well for them. And then they would take them off at the other end and run them down this incline on chains. And someone pointed out last time, because of that and because of the way the wheels went and everything on the transporter wagons, they actually had the wheels didn't go all the way across they were just small little 
stub wheels. It's a very bizarre way of doing it on these particular wagons, just to make sure that um, you know everything fitted and they didn't have to run 009 all the way to the port. Yes, they're running, yes. So John wants seagull sounds. Do you know, I didn't hear any seagulls when I was there. Were they there and I miss them? There will be, I've got some Fantasonic sounds, but they're just a bit too big porty. Um, so I may have to get some sounds off the internet and do it myself. But Fantasonics, I don't know if they're still going. I had all their CDs and I just don't know whether they're copyrighted or not um, now. So it would be better if I got some copyright free stuff. I mean, I bought them, but I'm not sure that counts for distribution rights. So um, I, I probably will have to make my own up with some seagulls and, um, you know, just the odd sound of something. So the gauge from the quarry to the port was just standard gauge. Um, yeah, it, so it was narrow gauge in the quarry, standard gauge on the run, and then narrow gauge again. But I think the Lamberis Lake Railway that's there now is narrow gauge. So I think they've they've just converted that bit. There was, um, but the main bit that ran down was, I've probably got a photo somewhere on the photo slideshow. So I might just put that up and see if it appears in a minute. Um, this is a photo slideshow of random people. This was the picture that made me start to do this, particular that one picture there. But I don't own the pictures, so I tend to just show it for inspiration. Um, and it does loop really weirdly, this. It doesn't like to show you that many photos. That's it. That's the train. I knew it was near the beginning. That's why it's behind my microphone. That's why I'm kind of doing it in a weird way. Um, and yeah, you can see. And this is the incline down into it. Where am I in this? Am I even in this? I'm not even in this picture. Oh, that's exciting. So there we go. Um, that was that was it. I'll go back to me because that's not really my things. Um, there was a transporter wagon with slate trucks and the tra truck brake van at Tawin. I've been there and I've got um, loads and loads and loads of photos of their quarry Hunslet. I am really looking forward to the Batman quarry Hunslets coming out. Um, we'll see when they come, whether they make this layout when it's finished. I'm not sure when they're due. There's sort of pre-production samples out now. I've got one on pre-order. So it will, they never ran at the port, but I would run one just because, you know, they're Dinorwick and they're the open cab sort and they were hard men in those days. It was not nice being open cab in Wales, even in the summer. So, mind, mind, mine. Sorry, I had to. <laughs> So Norm is channeling his inner Nemo with mine, 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 which is what the um, seagulls say in Finding Nemo. Um, Frank words, I work harder now in retirement than I ever did in my working life. Also, I've drilled a hole in my magnifying table light and the fluorescent tube lasts four times longer. Oh, that's interesting. The, the light and heat, yeah. I mean, fluorescents put out quite a lot of heat. I know that because they heat my room quite a lot upstairs in the loft. So Edward doesn't want the seagull sounds or doesn't need them because he's already got loads going around him. Um, Richard says there is a, oh, I've read that one. Uh, so actually Tim says it's four foot gauge. Okay, Tim knows everything about these things. So it's four foot gauge, not four foot, it's just standard to me. It's four foot gauge on the Padan, says Richard. So the Padan Railway, four foot gauge, not standard, as I said a minute ago, four foot, but it's certainly wider than the, um, narrow gauge which is also not a standard narrow gauge it shouldn't be 009 it should be a little bit smaller i just went i tried actually thinking about laying it the correct gauge in my version one and even then i shied away from it because it just becomes too much like hard work and here i just went i'm using normal points i'm not using their fancy track work which is all moving frogs and things i'm not using the hand laid track it's going simple going to be about scenery and atmosphere not about fancy track work so phil is going to have ambient sounds on his layout he'll be creating custom tracks with different sounds on left and right channels we play through different speakers the track will seamlessly loop phil i had you to love my loft i have my loft set up on 5.1 dolby stereo which is five or six even i think because of the point one counts channels of sound yep you can put a different channel on every single one. 
it's that cool yay but then I've lost the laptop it sat on so I can't play anymore I probably have the track somewhere getting it out in Dolby Stereo out of a laptop was hard I had to get a special audio card to do it but I did it it's a good thing um, so Stephen says I'd like to say a big thank you to yourself and other live streamers for taking the time out it's been a real morale boost during the last couple of years do you know it's been great for me as well because otherwise I don't get to talk to people I mean I'm you know I talk to my neighbours in the street if I see them but other than that I work at home I go into my mum's and see her and my sister every day and that'd be it you know when it was locked down I'd see them but I wouldn't see anyone else it's it so it was a big sort of lifesaver for me to get out and talk to people even if I'm almost like talking at people I still get people chatting back to me on text um yeah Norm's mind my mind seagull said that I, in finding Nemo for those who thought I'd lost my mind I got you Norm I didn't even get to that and I knew what you were saying <laughs> Simon's like he feels all nostalgic he's not been for donkeys I presume this is somewhere up north Wales that you've not been to it's a great place um they told me february 2023 i am losing track of all these things oh for the um quarry henslet february 2023 oh, i think this layout will be well done by then um gro it would be amazing if they made it with sound it would be i would pay extra for that but um i'm gonna put ambient sound in here i think that will have the sound of the loco moving or just the sounds of locos moving i just need to work out where i'd get that sound from probably a you know a actual sound decoder would work well you can put a sound decoder and just not have it on the loco and it will rev up and move then as your loco does so it works a lot better than just having it ambient going but not in sync um, it just doesn't go back and forth so that's probably the route I'm going to go um, they were saying early 23 for the quarry hands I reckon it would be difficult to convert to one of the port locos I've actually got two other shapeways ones with donor bases that I haven't bothered chipping or anything so the DC that I will look to um, basically put chips in and run but actually I only need two locos for this one for the front track one for the back track and then the Jinty for the middle track so I don't need a huge number of locos, so I'll probably do one more of them over time and get that done. Um, so we've now got a debate on what 009 is. So Richard Pike, 009 equals two foot three. Um, Denorit was one foot ten and three quarters. Yeah, I knew it was something weird. I'd have said it was one foot ten. I'd have forgotten the three quarters um, because it's 22 inches or something. So it's, it's a really weird one. Um, and there's no way I was going to do the difference between 22 and 27 or 23 and 27 inches. It's just, it's already finickety enough. And the problem is not the track. I could have laid the track. The problem is, what do you do with the locos? And the wagon's fine. What do you do with the locos? How do you get locos that run on that narrower gauge? You've got to completely build them from scratch. It's not going to happen for me. So Simon says DCC sound really irritates him. Um, it's okay in real life, but always sounds tinny and rubbish in videos. People are obsessed with it. Yeah, I, um, I, I, because I'll be doing ambient sound, it will probably be either up in the light unit, but I've got acetate there. It'll probably be underneath around, uh, so it'll be coming from under the layout. So it'll sound quite boomy, I expect. Have to have a bit of a play with it. Um, and then Sean says, current Welsh narrow gauge lines are two foot ish, apart from Welsh pool and Clanvire, which is two foot six. So two foot three is a good compromise. Yeah, they're just all over the place, aren't they? It's just whatever they pick, there was no standardisation. Um, and most of Port Dinorwick, all the little trackage at the front was all hand pushed. It wasn't, the locos couldn't get at it. And the locos couldn't get around most of the quarry. Most of that was hand pushed. They only picked it up and ran it along the actual galleries. You know, a lot of the rest of it was hand pushed around. So the smaller the better for that, I think. Um, do you think Hornby should get in the 009 business? No, nope, I don't necessarily think Hornby should um, get in the 009 business. I I like the... I don't buy Hornby very often. And um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Um, I would rather someone like Rapido got in the 009 business because, you know, I like Jason Schwann. He's a great guy. I've really gone well with him. And he does quirky stuff, but he's not into North Wales, so not likely to happen. Um, 
Moldy Raspberry is a great sound library of local sounds. Maybe you could mix them. The thing with you've just got to watch if it's going on um, YouTube at all, it has to be um, licensed, copyright free. So when you nick stuff, you just have to be careful if you're going to put it on YouTube. So Edward thinks Hornby would if they could make a lot of money going by the current trend of the company. Yeah, they should focus on sorting their current offers out before diversifying services, Simon Reeves. Dunk Sergeant's Cast Valley Railroad in N scale. Hi, Cathy, what's your favourite stationary DCC sound decoder? I was just going to use a num normal one and just sync it onto the same number. So I was just going to use a normal loco one. I've got a few sat around, um, steam loco-ish or diesel, and load up the sound if I can, um, and just have it keyed into the same number. So it's just not, it's a moving one, but it's not on the loco. That's what I was going to do. Um, Richard, where do you get your ambient sign from? I'm looking for distant artillery for World War One 009 layout. I get mine online, I just look for copyright free sound library and you can get them. It's just, yeah. I've also, in my FCP, um, which is my video processing software, it's got tons of um, sounds anyway. So I tend to use those a lot. Right, it's nearly time. So I'm going to clear the comments that are there and then it will be time to say good night. My throat's going, so definitely need to. Um, Pete Wilson used 8 millimeter gauge track for Quarrel Kumbach. He told me he regretted it because he couldn't borrow locos from other layouts when he's had a problem. That is just the reason it's the locos. It's the only reason that makes it really hard. And GRR Railway agrees strongly with that, I think. So Timber gives a fantastic website for creating your own background sounds is ambientmixer.com. And um, Phil Wright says... He's met Jason Schwann a few times. He's a brilliant bloke. I love Jason to bits. Um, he actually went to Birmingham University and did a fine art degree for a couple of years. And I almost got to see him in Toronto, but I didn't. Next time I go over there, I'm definitely going to see him. Um, I always see him when he comes over to the NEC. And um, just, we went to Comic-Con together for an hour and a half from Wally one year. Yeah, he's a really great guy. I really, really like Jason. I can't say how nice a guy he is. He genuinely is. So yeah, met his wife, just great great people edward mill says don't gauge master do a few ambient dcc decoders okay so for dcc for ambient i probably wouldn't use dcc i'd just have a normal sound system that comes on you can get all sorts of ways of recording small amounts of sound to play including just putting your iphone in there or something like that you know old ipod whatever it is there are loads of different ways probably have an old iPod somewhere. There are loads of different ways you can get sound onto a layout if it's just ambient. I had a computer sound system up on my last one, plug the laptop in, do the sound. Um, but when you're doing a loco, you want to use a DCC decoder so the sound goes up and down as your loco moves. It's the only reason I'd use a DCC decoder for sound is if it's a moving item. Even if I'm putting it not in the loco, I'd still use that. So, okay, right. So anyway, I'm going to say good night to everyone. Um, Plastic Monkey, good night. I do all my own film work, Mike. That's why the whole cameras were blurry. It's all on me. Can't blame anyone else. <gasps> Sexy chatter back. But thankfully, Timber Surf's got in there this time. Um, <laughs> just makes me laugh. That's why you have moderators, folks. And thank you so much to mine for the great job they do in keeping people in line. And um, good night, Stephen. All the best up in Scotland. GR Railways in Birmingham. Oh, I'm Solly Holson, just a little bit south. But uh, yep, <laughs> they are back. Night si Simon, night David. Thank you so much, guys. Um, best wishes to everybody. Have a great time. Um, I'll post what I'm doing a little bit more regularly on Instagram. And I was having a bit of an off time on social media, so you'll see what I'm up to. And I'll see you in the next live stream, which should be the second Sunday in June. See you then. Take care. Bye.